Now we're on. Okay. This is session two. So like I said, prior to um, breaking for session one, geared towards our current and new act sites, we'll get into some nitty gritty. And after we get back here around two o'clock following lunch, will be opportunity to have uh, more conversation as opposed to just us talking to you and feeding you information. So i um, excited about that and really excited to be up here talking to you face to face as opposed to over the phone or via email. So it's really nice to finally in person meet a lot of you folks that um, between Vince and myself, we've been interacting with you for the past couple of years. So before, um, as we kick off here and before we get into the fun things we're going to talk about today. I just want to orient us to what it is we're looking to get out of our, our second session here today. So quickly, I want to review our activity for the rest of 2018. I know we uh, in the earlier session went through a, a high level timeline. So I want to talk in a little bit more depth what we're planning uh, across all of our, um, uh, our tiers for 2018. Also give you a perspective so that you, you better understand the current state of the ACT network. So we have uh, Mark, who's going to be speaking to all of you about that and network operations. Then when we get back from lunch, uh, we're gonna have more of an open conversation, discuss best practices, and we have our, our I2B2 folks that are going to help orient us into thinking like a production network. So what it's going to take for us to begin or continue to productionalize our ACT nodes. And then we're going to pick back up with our I2B2 plugin conversation around the technology for participant identification so we can look at what we can expect in, in 2019 and beyond. So I'm not gonna go through this in, in too much detail again here, but uh, you know, just a, a high level view as to what's going on across our waves one, two, three, four, and beyond throughout the rest of 2018 and then 2019 and beyond just highlighting our dissemination activities joining and onboarding to the network, and then rolling out the I2B2 plugins. But what I do want to talk about more specifically is our goals for 2018. So I know it's a lot of words on the slide here, and um, if this shouldn't come as totally new information for all of you, but I know sometimes depending upon what wave or what tier your, your institution currently is, is participating in at the moment, you might not have the visibility into what's going on for uh, some of the other nodes here on the network. So um, throughout the summer, we're going to be promoting our Wave 3 sites to the ACT production network. So those are the sites that uh, are currently participating in our staging network. They're going to move on to production and then focus on dissemination activities. Wave four, we're going to kick off uh, our implementation in August here and, and complete that technical part of our, our act onboarding throughout the calendar year. We're gonna continue our dissemination efforts across our wave one and two sites. And then once wave three sites are introduced to production, we're going to kick off dissemination and roll out to end users uh, then and do that by the end of the year. So we have a lot of goals um, in the next six months here. We're going to upgrade to Shrine 1.25.4, I believe, is the version we're moving to. This was just rolled out to our test network, so our four pilot sites the other week. So they've been going through the process of installing it and providing any feedback so we can work out any tweaks before rolling out to staging and production. Uh, we're going to expand our current test and staging networks. I know a question was brought up in the last session about uh, having a non-production node, which of course we, we absolutely recommend and something to keep in mind for our wave four sites as you're standing up your instances. And we'll be talking through how you can connect and participate in our test network or connect to stage so that you have uh, the opportunity to you know, follow best practice and go through any new installs there prior to moving into production. Um, talk a little bit more about that later. We will move to a new version of the act ontology, date and version TBD. I know right now a lot of you um, have seen the emails come through about doing a, a very minor upgrade over the next couple of weeks. Um, so this is a more, a much larger uh, and a little bit more disruptive ontology update that we have planned. Um, but more information will come, but it's, it's going to be exciting. There's a lot of work behind it, but it's, it's really going to provide our users with um, the ability to query across many, many more terms than what are currently available in the ACT ontology. As Vivian and, and Sean were talking to earlier, we were demonstrating the I2B2 plugin technology in the ACT test network. So our, our four pilot sites have actually already installed the technology, but we're going to continue 
uh, making refinements across the test network prior to our rollout in 2019. And then defining and distributing the regulatory and guidance um, uh, or regulatory and governance guidance for participant identification. As was mentioned, the actual identification will be done locally, but we still want to make sure from a regulatory and a governance standpoint, we're accounting for everything that you're going to need to know whenever you go through and roll out the technology locally. All right, so what does this actually look like? It's much prettier in color, right? So um, I uh, want to give you just some perspective as to when this is happening or scheduled to happen. You can't see it at the very end, but most importantly, note that timing is subject to change. That's why I was hesitant to put actual dates on here, but the months are, are you can plan for these, these months here, but um, you'll see the colors representing what tier of the network this activity is happening in. Green represents all tiers. Um, so again, just everything that we went through in the previous slide mapped out across the next couple of months here. Um, so you can see that activity that uh, we have scheduled to start and hopefully wrap up by the end of the calendar year. So I can absolutely make this available following this meeting so that you can um, have it for reference. Yes. Development and the dissemination of the act ontology sort of as it's occurring um, and opportunities for community input and such. Certainly. So I know we've been talking about it in our monthly data harmonization work group calls, which we've we've had on and off. Uh, they meet the first Monday of each month. So this this ontology has been in development for uh, quite some time. Michelle can. Michelle's going to going to talk more to some of the details here a little bit later, but we do have a test server as well that I can I can make that information available so you can actually see what that ontology is and and take a moment to orient yourself to that. Um, I know we also have a um, couple of surveys that have gone out uh, through the data harmonization work group. I don't think that's going to be that that will probably be down the road some of the input from those surveys for a future ontology release not what we have planned for this year um, but i'm not going to steal michelle's thunder i'll let her talk talk to that here uh, in, in just a little bit but does that sort of help answer your question okay all right any other questions on the timeline before we move on to why you're all here today All right, excellent. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mark to walk you through network operations. Okay. So, um, we covered so far kind of why Act and Vivian and you know, what organizations are in it. What it is now and what it will be, thanks to the and Doug, and when things will um, happen. I'm going to go through and go into the first of these next three sessions because it's probably maybe one of the more mundane things. You know, this is like hosting and kind of stuff. And I want to start out by just asking for a show of hands who here is from a site in wave one or two? And how about wave three? All right. How about neither or don't know? Okay, we're going to put that. All right. Oh, four, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to four as well. Four. Yeah, four. Three, four. I know. All right, so let me talk to you. There's an ugly detail. One of you in front of you is going to help you understand. A lot of the process that I'm going to talk about are things that we, we're going to talk about what we have right now. And uh, we'll also mention that some of these things will change or be improved in the future. Uh, um, so let me. Did I get me to advance here? I, I can't hear you. It's up to you. Okay. Um, let me just introduce the concept of the network operations group. So we realized, uh, Doug sort of mentioned that the fact that we have to juggle and manage. I2B2 versions, shrine versions, ontology, things like data processes and maintenance, all of this requires some level of coordination. So there is now a network operations group that came about just out of necessity. 
Um, this group sort of will help coordinate those different activities as they happen across the different tiers and um, will help just make sure that we are rolling things out at the right times so that we keep things in a, a good shape for users and we keep us moving forward with the technology. Um, we'll also do some monitoring that I'll talk about and also be disseminating some things around best practices. Um, and if necessary, we would escalate issues if there were major production issues or things that we needed to change course on. Um, the network operations group might be the first place that that gets discussed. Um, but let me start up to talking about terminology. Um, I think we sort of covered the idea that there is a hub and spoke the topology to the network with a hub um, and that there are sites or downstream nodes or instances of the software at sites in the act network. Um, so these are the local installations of I2B2 shrine with the ontology and your local data and then a centrally managed hub. And Sam Choi over here, uh, so I think a lot of you might know or have interacted with, um, manages those manages those hubs. Um, we've also got three networks, which I think Doug mentioned, production, stage, and test. So I'll go into a little more detail there. Yeah. So, um, so the different sites, mm -hmm. in earlier slides, we saw them referred to as hubs also. Yeah. Are they actually set up as hubs or are they just called hubs right now? Yeah, they're called the CTSA hubs. I think it's a term that gets used. Correct. CTSA hubs. Yeah, but from a sort of technical standpoint, they are nodes on your, node on your network. network. Exactly. Yep. The network is a collection of nodes, downstream nodes, instances that all attach to a single hub. So that's where it gets confusing. So there's an act hub, there's one act hub per network. And multiple CTSA hubs that are nodes on your network. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly that's what we want to get across. That's what gets real confusing. Um, and that does play into um, configuration of the software. So it's really, it's important that people know, yes, they are a CTSA hub for folks on the phone, I'm making air quotes, but you are a downstream node in that network. And there are three networks that we have at this point. So production, of course, is where we want to have high reliability, high data quality. This is where we have users, end users, actually querying the network. Um, right now, just waves one and two, um, and then we'll have, we have sort of a phased process that you've seen of opening it up to end users. Stage network, first and primary purpose is for sites that are joining the network. These downstream nodes, before they're on production, join up to stage, and then are promoted to production. Secondary purpose here is for this to be sort of a practice instance. If you have a a non-production node that you want to hook up to a, uh, a hub, to a network, this is where you can do it. Um, this is never open to end users, and right now there's the Wave 3 sites. Test network, right now just four sites connected. Um, again, not open to end users. A lot of times the test network will be in a different version of ontology, software, et cetera and the uh, stage or production networks, because this is where we're sort of doing acceptance testing, if you will, for the network or say software that's coming out to make sure that it's gonna work and it's gonna meet the needs of the network before we put it out, push it out further. Um, we also have to thank the test sites that are on the network because they help us also gauge um, how difficult it's gonna be to install. If there's any questions, they help us refine our installation instructions, that sort of thing. So the test network is important to us. Um, we are open to further participants on the test network if you're able to help out that way. Um, and as we mentioned, we do strongly encourage sites to have a non-production network after they join production, either on stage or on test. Um, test, as we said, is where you can help us out by trying out the software, um, giving us feedback, that sort of thing. Stage, it's you're sort of more on your own. You're free to use that as a practice instance, but um, we're not going to be looking to you for early feedback in that case. But it's your choice where you want to have your non production instance. Now, uh, monitoring. We just sort of started sharing some with the stage network. We've done this for production. Um, this will evolve in time. Um, right now, Sam runs a weekly query. Sort of a sample of it here from production. 
And we hope to develop tools in the near term that will do this in a more automated manner. What you're seeing here is a slice of what we call the smoke test. Um, nine queries. They we chose terms here that we thought should be relatively trouble-free, like you know, gonna see them in event, Tylenol. Is it possible that there's an institution that has never used Tylenol? Yes. Is it likely? No. So our expectation is that all of these queries should return counts unless there's some quirk of your data or institution that you could let us know about uh, where you might have 10 patients or fewer for some reason, or you could see if results weren't available at that particular time. So this would go out weekly and we ask for sites to look at this and if there are problems here to please address them. Um, we do want you to maintain you, you know, a sense of a, a sort of a situational awareness of your connection to the network, um, even independent of this weekly test. But this is just one opportunity for us to give you a reflection back of how your site is doing at one point in time during the week. Um, enlarged to show detail, um, I'm showing here 10 patients or fewer. Is this, a, is this possibly true? Maybe, um, you know, depending on if you have ICD-9, ICD-10. But we, again, we sort of expect that these would all be green. Um, and we also want you to address problem spots, and those are usually in red text here. So results aren't available. You know, why did this particular query take this longer period of time? Um, these are where you should be investigating when you see these. So a very small number of patients should make you sort of scratch your chin. Or if results weren't available, there was some other error, also something to look at. Um, you can also, too, if you need assistance, we have a help desk JIRA system at University of Pittsburgh. Um, we're going to be using that for taking questions and filtering them through to whoever might be able to help you with it. Yes? I'm, I'm wondering if in your future plans, by the way, this is great, really helpful for us to monitor ours. But I wonder if there's, um, sort of with the caveat and the knowledge that uh, there's, a, there's a fair amount of heterogeneity across our network. Yeah institutions uh, and hospitals. Um, I wonder if we might be able in the future to get a little bit more granular rather than just sort of count return, but I wonder if there's a way that we can more, um, if we can benchmark just a little bit and give us maybe an indication if we've got a data quality problem at our site. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's, it's you're only going to be able to get so fine, but um, there might be an opportunity rather than just to count what is it um, and be able to, to maybe investigate based on that. Yeah, but I think the other thing, the other way this could be improved too, but it requires a more of a longitudinal view is to see how that changes over time. Yeah, right. And it was just going up, like, why would this go down? Yeah. Um, so there's, there's definitely more opportunity in that. But we don't want to, I think the, the line that we're sort of walking here is we're looking at connectivity. And this is sort of an extension of just are people connected? Do they have data loaded at a very sort of gross level? We're sort of walking this line between data characterization and you know ontology and that sort of effort and just straight up connectivity. It is the network all connected properly. So um, take your point over that maybe that level of granularity deeper might be interesting. Yeah, and I think actually probably of interest to our users is probably our funders as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I think we talked a little bit earlier, we do have a data characterization survey that's going to kind of get a sense for what data are expected at different sites. And we're also looking to make the results of that available to end users in some way, shape, or form in the future. So that if they see something that's sort of confusing or, you know, my goodness, why don't they have more of these patients since it's a children's hospital? You know. <laughs> I mean, and, and sort of additional phase of data characterization, I think, is where we're talking about with the fit. It's kind of like a surface level uh, kind of monitoring. We want to make sure as part of the onboarding efforts of, of sites to make sure that, that they are returning account. 
Um, we don't want to see any errors. And also, if there's something yellow, you know, is that expected? Uh, if it is, then fine, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, move on to the next part. Uh, but yes, something later down the line, we can get more granular in terms of actually including the counts. And then, as what we mentioned before, when the next version of the software goes out, you know, the query time isn't that relevant anymore because all the queries will be coming back asynchronously. So then uh, results come back as they, as they come. So if you are still concerned about how your individual site is performing, you know, we as the hub can have further insight into how long it took for your site to, to return for that particular query. So, uh, so this is just kind of like a preliminary monitoring effort. Uh, and Mark mentioned that we're going to try to automate a lot of these functions so that I don't have to do it every week or, you know, we can expand on what this initial test describes and add more granularity or more variety to it as well. And the reason I want to call this sort of shared monitoring, I mean, this is, this is sort of giving a snapshot at one point in the week. Um, you know, I really am encouraging all sites to try to be aware of performance issues, to solicit feedback from your end users, to do some queries yourself uh, to understand the performance as well. Uh, like I say, this is just a snapshot, and so it really does require um, the folks in the room that are sort of hands on keyboard at the sites to be trying to keep an eye on this as well, uh, if you can. Um, and like I said, we'll, once a week, we'll try to give you an indication of this, but it shouldn't be your only indication of health. Be that's it would be a good way to go too. Yeah, yeah. So there's I think there's a lot of possibilities here. I think we're just we're start of just developing it. Sorry, just no. Nope. Did you volunteer? Yeah, sure. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> oh, all right. Thank you, Jay. Duly noted. Um, Doug mentioned we have a network maintenance window that we're trying to adhere to. Uh, again, just because we now have end users, we're starting to have end users, and we're just trying to keep the network, the production network, um, at a, a good place for users. Um, 4 p.m. Tuesday Eastern to 7 a.m. Wednesday is more asking people to try to confine any um, churn in the network to that time. There may be times when Elena will ask you to do something outside of that, or um, we acknowledge that something might go beyond that, that window. That's fine, but we're just trying to keep things as, as contained as possible so we can communicate to end users. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing too is that we do have some mailing lists that I'll get to. You know, you may also, if there's something that's going to happen either during this window or outside of it, try to let the rest of the network know. Um, so there's a mailing list that you can use. So like what you plan to do, what change you know you expect there to be, or what the, the downtime should look like. Um, is useful for us to know just that if we get someone saying, you know, oh, this is, you know, I'm seeing this, we can say, yep, you know, we were sort of aware of that already. Uh, so communication channels, we've got an act mailing list. Um, if you're not familiar with these, we can get you familiar with them. Um, we also do some direct communications. So there may be times, I'm thinking especially for wave three or wave four, when we might ask you to use the GRI help desk, or we may say, listen, you know, there is a time crunch going on, like just work with Sam and copy Elena and myself on it. Um, and then we also have the ACT help desk. And again, it's easy to track, but that requires some maintenance on its own. So um, we're trying to get a feel for how to be efficient, but also track what we're doing, make sure that nobody sort of falls through the cracks and we don't support you, um, but also getting things done when we need to. Um, the help desk here, there is, I think we're doing one login per site, is that yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah, in wait four sites, we're in the process of expanding our, our zero license. We don't have an upgrade of all our wait four sites, but um, as soon as we finalize all of the contractual fun stuff there, um, we'll be um, onboarding one user from your institutions as well to the help desk. As well. Yeah, so waves one and two and three, um, I think you, if you don't know who the person is that has access to the help desk, find out a uh, way forward that will be coming and it, just to clarify this isn't open to end users so we're not expecting that you would send end users to this help desk we want the end users to be helped locally to have a face for the act network at the site where they can um, get help if something is beyond your understanding or ability then you might consider using the mailing list or the help desk uh, let's see so going forward uh, 
Um, we are going to be having a larger production network. We've mentioned that. We're going to be having a test and rollout of a Shrine release, um, continuing to work with the data harmonization, dissemination work group, technology work group, really to have sort of a production ready, and we'll talk more about that, um, high quality network, and then maybe do some more work with network monitoring and do things in a more automated fashion because Sam is a busy man and uh, it's not nothing to be doing those tests. I also just want to run through really quickly, especially probably for Wave 4 sites, that there are um, site functions that I want to run through. These are functions not necessarily mapping to a single person. So there might be multiple functions um, performed by a single person, or there might be sort of a shared responsibility for some of these functions. But we expect at every site there's going to be a sysadmin. This is the person that would be hands-on keyboard doing things like you know, um, installing updates of software, that kind of thing. We'd also work closely with uh, the site operations coordinator down here, who might be our main point of contact, um, and also perhaps somebody who was involved with the data. Um, so this admin, site operations coordinator, uh, there may be so the function of a research data curator, so somebody who really knows about the data and why things might be a certain way because of the EHR or historical nuances of the data. Um, we would need someone who's sort of aware of that. We need a data steward. So this is somebody who helps monitor the use of the network by your own users. So it's site monitoring the usage of the network by their site. Um, and then also a dissemination lead. So the dissemination work group works with, uh, yeah, sorry, this is not far down here. Um, the simulation work group will work with one person or a, a group of people in order to roll out to end users at the site. So I just want to make you aware of those different functions. Like I said, it could be one person, could be many, but these are the roles or the functions we expect to exist at a given site. So it's kind of a lightning round of a lot of stuff. Anybody have any questions we can answer at this point about those? Because if not, I think I'm turning over to Mitch. Thanks. The one thing I would ask is that you say near the computer because when you want to be far away from it, it's hard to be up to the Perfect. This is good. So, my name is Nish Wanasin. I've been working with the ITP2 team for quite a while. Um, I'm part of the team here that's sitting over here for Swati, Vivian, Jay, and Rita, and Mark over there, that are responsible for developing some of the software for phase two, which you'll hear about after lunch. So I just want to give some technology overview, um, try to demystify some of the confusion about how things connect together. I'm probably going to end up confusing you even more. <laughs> But continue. So this is the, the third time you've been here since this morning, the third time you've seen this map. Um, it's a great map. Right? <laughs> but I want to show the significance um, of the centralized Shrine Hub. So this is the one at Shrine Hub that exists. Um, this is quite important because essentially the communication takes place between the sites and the hub. And I'll um, show you about the communication in detail in the next couple of slides. So as uh, Mark mentioned, this is the, of course, the hub and spoke network topology. Um, but I'm going to hone in on essentially just one site and the communication to the hub and try to answer essentially two questions. Uh, what happens? when someone at your site submits a query? And how does your site respond to incoming queries from other sites or either from your, from your own site? So zooming into just your site alone, of course, um, if you're an assessment, you have Shrine and you have ITV2 installed. So this is a very a simplified slide about um, the various components. There's many more configurations and components um, at each site. But here, of course, you have ITV2, and this is where your EHR data is. Um, 
that EHR data can be queried by your local ontology. We'll go into more of that. Uh, Shrine has, of course, the network ontology. This is the common ontology um, that Michelle works on. She'll talk more about that. And this is the ontology that essentially you don't make edits to. Everyone in the network, um, an investigator at any site using the Shrine web client will see the same ontology. Uh, at this point in phase one, this is in the Shrine world, this is what kind of where your local users live. So your Shrine project, and I'll kind of try to go into that a little, in, in a little detail, but um, your Shrine essentially has, has a set, set of users. Uh, the Shrine is getting a little technical, but it has the query entry point, and this allows you to, your Shrine uh, node to communicate with the Act Hub, and of course the adapter that was mentioned before, allowing the Act Hub to communicate back with your nope. And so really this thing boils down to two functions that I mentioned before that um, I'll talk more about sending a query, so what happens in that function, and of course being able to respond to a query. So this is kind of the typical setup um, that you'll see at your site. Um, of course, you're familiar with um, some of the components here. You have your site will have a Shrine web client uh, connected to an I2B2 project management cell. Uh, there's the, and here you have a project for your Shrine. The project contains a network ontology that doesn't change. Of course, it represents the, the act ontology. Um, as Doug mentioned, there's previous queries. This project, what's important about it is that your patient data doesn't live here. Your patient data lives in your I2B2 project. And I'll try to give the difference between that later. And of course, this is your set of users. And then here, the dotted line there is the, the firewall between your site and the Shrine Hub. I'll get you. Uh, no problem. Shrine users always have data aggregation and data office space. Is that hard coded in there or is there something you have to make sure that? In Sam, maybe you can. When you create a new user, it, it's checked out by default. By default, okay. All right. Okay. So, a lot of my next slides just have a bunch of animations to try to eliminate how much I actually talk and make mistakes. Uh, so, I give this simple example here. Um, John over here, he logs into the Shrine web client. And you can see here, this is the, the login, and his login here is authenticated against the I2B2 project manage, management cell. And you know the, the Shrine web client uh, is displayed to uh, So let's say a very simple example is that John wants to find the number of patients uh, with a diagnosis of asthma uh, across the app network. So essentially, he formulates his query as everyone Pretty understands um, dragging finding asthma in the ontology and dragging over it to formulate his query. So this is just one concept in the panel. The query you know makes its way through I2B2 to the shrine query entry point, connects to the hub, and then essentially the hub broadcasts that query out to all the known participating sites in the network. So on the flip side, what happens after that query gets broadcasted? So this is responding to a query. Um, so every participating site on the network, if they're up at the time, receives that query at their Shrine adapter. And as you can see, this is the concept that represents asthma comes in. Um, there's this one-to-one -one mapping strategy that you've probably heard about. There's a lot of there's discussion about how that works and Michelle will go into more detail in, <laughs> in her next uh, oh, but I'll, I'll, I have a couple slides on just how that works. So that strategy of one-to-one -one mapping comes in. And so this at this point, this just wanted to highlight and emphasize that John's account is no longer running that query to receive, to, to receive the results, right? Because of course, John's account is not known across the network. So what happens is that that query now um, uses a dedicated Shrine service account. So this is just part of the configurations when you're setting up Shrine to run that query on John's behalf. So you can see just, it's a computer. 
And this computer now logs in, this Shrine Service account logs into the project manager in cell to take that query, query your I2B2 CRC, your big patient data over here, coming back with an aggregate account at, you, at your local site or at one site. And you can see here it's just 1.2 million patients. That results gets sent back to the Shrine Hub. And on the next slide, you'll see with all the other sites um, in real time, as we discussed, and those results are displayed back to the originating investigator who made the query. So this is just a couple slides I threw in here, just, just to discuss one-to-one -one mapping, but um, there's a lot more details that you know we discuss offline. So why is there that one-to-one -one mapping thing to begin with? So of course you have here the I2B2 ontology, um, or sorry, the ACT ontology. And as you are probably aware, that ACT ontology is represented by these paths. So this is these are these um, hierarchical paths. You can think of them been connected. You can think of them as a uh, like a like a file system in, in a tree. So so all these folder folders that you see here on the left are represented by unique paths on the right. So this is kind of what it looks like in your database. So the one-to-one -one mapping is important because you have for your shrine instance for your shrine um, project, you'll have this act ontology loaded, and this is, and you don't actually make any modifications to this ontology. But when your act ontology is at your local site, you might want to put other things, and this is just one of the mapping strategies, so it's just one of the ETL strategies you can use at your site. So you might, for example, when this query came in, this is the path that represents asthma. So it's underneath you know, diagnoses, diseases, or respiratory system, um, chronic lower respiratory and then asthma. So this query comes in to every site. Now, when it comes into a local site, let's just say for whatever reason, at your local site, there's local codes that represent asthma that you might, of course, that represent those patients at your local site that you wanna to include to make sure that, that those patients are received and serviced by that query. So at your local institution, you might want to put those local codes underneath you know, basically hide them, fit them into your act ontology. No, that makes sense, but okay. So in summary, um, just kind of putting everything together, this is essentially what it looks like, you know, typically at a site. So this is at partners and your setup kind of looks something like this. And then there's this, long animation where, of course, the user logs in here, um, formulates this query, runs it, it gets submitted to the Shrine Hub, Shrine Hub broadcasts it to all the different sites. Of course, it's received at the same Shrine adapter at your local site. Um, the Shrine service account logs in and runs that query on behalf of the investigator in real time, receiving aggregate accounts to the Shrine Hub. And of course, the Shrine Hub returns all of the counts in real time back to the investigator. So simple. All right, I'm not, I'm not talking one more time. I'm just gonna, so this guy does this and it goes over here and. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's all being recorded. Oh, goodness. <laughs> okay, so yeah, and you can see this is what happens on one side, and then this is happening in every site that's connected. <laughs> now Michelle's up to just. Correct everything I've said. No. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to do the ontology. There's no animation. I don't even know how to make this move. Okay. All right, so I can. All right. Okay, so first we just want to 
highlight the background to the ontology for the act ontology. The act ontology is um, led by the data harmonization work group. They kind of figure out what's going to be in the ontology and when it should go in. Um, that group's led by Sean versus Warren. There are actually four subgroups, but I lead one that I've never met with, so I only put the ones that exist. So Deb Batson, I guess, is leading the lab subgroup, which is, I think, the most active subgroup. And then the general subgroup, uh, Sean meets with them the first Monday of each month. Um, the, I don't know why I put this one line here, but from now going forward, we're going to be using the wiki to distribute the files. We've gone all different kind of ways. We've done box, we've done true centrics, we've done uh, emails. But I think so what we're going to do now is we're going to repurpose the act wiki, which we'll give you the link to, and that's how the files will be distributed in the future. Um, the goals for the ontology. Um, Oh, okay. So mainly what we're trying to do is get the baseline of all the things that are most commonly available readily at all the different sites to just get a baseline ontology. So your labs, your meds, your diagnosis and your procedures, your demographics and some visit details. So that's kind of what's guiding what's going into the version one and, and the next version of the ontology. Um, We've talked a lot about the shrine ontology being the one that you should not change. And one of the reasons why Niche did that um, animation and the thing that we're really trying to drive home is that we really want people to have the shrine ontology and their local ontology. Because I talked to a lot of sites and we've some sites have been short circuiting the process and just pointing their shrine instance to their I2B2 ontology. And you can run into some troubles when you do that. And it also takes away some of the flexibility that you have and that the network has to kind of move things into production without upsetting the entire network. And then the, at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the data characterization survey. Uh-oh. Oh, it says Mosey Home. Jimmy, help me. Um, so this is just an overview of what's in the ontology. The stuff in the red are the things that are going to be in the new ontology. Um, for diagnosis, we do have that 10 9 hybrid ontology, which we're also going to add a 10 ontology that is just straight ICD 10s um, throughout, and it'll be in a later version of UMLS because I believe the one that's in there now is from 2015. So it's missing a few terms. Um, and then CPT 4 gets special note because I, uh, we're still kind of working out how we're allowed to deliver it. But right now, we're only going to provide the CPT 4 ontology to sites that can document that they have a CP24 license. Uh, okay, so where are we now? Okay, we've been going round and round on going to the new ontology. We were really close to releasing it and then we kind of pulled back because we decided that we wanted to add more um, sites to the network before we expand the ontology. So um, where we're at right now is that the production sites are on version one of the ontology. And it has modifiers in production, um, diagnosis, labs, and meds. And over the next couple of weeks, what we're gonna be doing is moving to some hybrid of the version one ontology, depending on where you are right now. Um, the production sites are just gonna run a little bit of update statements to remove the modifiers. And because what we're trying to do is minimize the disruption from going from version one of the ontology to going to the new ontology. And the modifiers are different in the two ontologies. So what we decided to do is disable the ones that are in the version one ontology so that 
the wave three and wave four sites that have been doing their ETL towards the new ontology won't have to do any work that's going to get thrown away. Yes, sir. Say it again. An active med. Inactive med. So in the new ontology, which I'll show you now, the, I mean, a little in a couple of slides, I have tried to take care of the inactive meds and add the NDCs. So you'll see it in a couple of slides. Um, but what's important is that wave three sites, if you already have put version one of the ontology on your staging network, you also just have to run a little bit of code to remove the modifiers, but you also will run another little bit of code, which is gonna change your diagnosis prefixes to be more specific than what we have in the version one ontology. So in the version one ontology, ICD-9 prefixes are ICD-9 colon, and ICD-10 prefixes are ICD-10 colon. In the new ontology, we, because ICD-10s have ICD-10-CM, which are just diagnosis, and then ICD-10 PCS, which are um, procedures, and there's a little bit of overlap in the numbers there. So we want to correct that, and then so we decided to do it for the IC9s as well. So the way the ontology is going to work is if you're a Wave 3 site, you're going to have prefixes that are good going forward to the new ontology. The production sites are going to have to do that a little bit later. So that's why we have all these different versions, because I'm trying to track which path you are taking to get to um, this little endpoint, this little intermediate state. Sure. Yes, sir. It's way before this, you know, you have your IC twins and you got things running. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we want to add this whole bunch of ontologies to your concept dimension. Mm -hmm. Right. So you do, so you put those in the concept dimension, so that we can use them in the queries that are coming off of the shrine node, or that's cool. Mm -hmm. But then we just want to use then then you want to go through them and say, okay, I see. So you know, I use uh, ICD9XXX as my prefix and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And so for ICD9s in there, I'll just, you know, in the column, which is concept underscore CD, use, you know, I'll put that in there. Right. right? That's, what, that's what the these little bit of update statements do on a kind of a... But, but, but it wouldn't be, you're not really updating Tables. No, you're updating the ontology tables. I'm just talking about ontology tables. Right. You're not necessarily going to be able to update it with ICD9 or ICD10CM. Well, like, here's the thing. Using ICD10 right. And right. If you are, that's fine. Okay. So, but we had given them an ETL coding guideline that told them to do these things. So they may have already coded to ICD-9-CM, ICD-10, PCS, or whatever. So we are trying to align the ontology to what we told them we would be doing for the new ontology. Yes, 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 yes. But the production sites did not. So that's why we're not doing that for them. But what we want is for the Shrine ontology to be able to work for both sets of people groups right right exactly so but like michelle said so if you started from scratch right, right. they gave you a, a, a guideline to work for great but if you're like you, you already have it then you just it's it on you you have to figure it out yourself really i mean that's really what i'm saying yeah so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh huh. 
like the name meditation modifier. All of you, the detail guys. Right, because for the new ontology, which this is not, this is the old ontology tweaked just a little bit until wave three and maybe wave four get on the network. The new ontology did have new modifiers and I mean, it has the stuff that's in that guideline thing. Right. Right, that won't get access, correct. Right, because what, what I thought was better was that you do that instead of doing all this ETL that you would actually end up throwing away because the old mod, you would have had to ETL to the old modifiers, right? And then you would have to turn around again and then do the new modifiers. So that's why we're relaxing all the modifiers so that nobody can do a query with a modifier until people are up with the all consistent. You see, does that make sense? Right. 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 Yeah. Right. But we kind of pause the moving forward a little bit. So, so I'm trying to balance it without making people do a whole lot of rework is what I'm really trying to do. Yes, sir. They might come back. Yes, they're in the they're in the new guideline for the new ontology. There were modifiers in the new ontology. So, if the data harmonization group and all of you are can be a part of it and voice your opinion and decide that you know what, as a network, we don't want to do any modifiers. That would be up to you guys. I will not vote on that either way. But right now there are modifiers in the new ontology. So the, the basic ones, it's just um, diagnosis primary or secondary and the meds are the ones that have the other modifier. It's um, administered, ordered or result. I'm not result, um, what is it? Dispensed, dispensed, administered and prescription or ordered. So those are the modifiers that are in the new ontology. If you don't want them, I would suggest you get on that data harm call and vote no modifiers or send her a note. Don't send me a note. <laughs> you have until August, she says, because <laughs> it's really easy to drop modifiers. True. Interest in modifiers? Okay, who wants modifiers? <laughs> I know. So here's the thing, which the other thing we'll look at is actually we have some modifiers again in the existing, but a lot of people aren't responding to the modifier queries because, you know, some people just can't get at that data or aren't willing to go to that level of detail of getting at that data. So one of the things with the data characterization, I think we're also going to look into is, you know, what, even if we put the modifiers, how many of you will be ignoring those queries anyway? So is it worth the time for everybody else to do it? Uh-huh. Right. I will say that right now, any of the, I did go back and look at the queries that have gone across the network so far, no one's issued one, except for like somebody who's testing it like me, but no one has issued any modifier queries yet. So, I mean, mentally we all think, oh, you wanna know if it's a primary diagnosis or, oh, is it a, you know, ordered lab or uh, ordered, you know, med, but no one's issuing that type of query. So, I mean, we can say no modifiers. I'm fine with that. Well, we only have two now, so you got two to get rid of if you want to get rid of them. It's not like I'm adding any. So, you want to vote again?
who's okay either okay well, let's go with that who's okay with or without modifier with either way um so i mean i think you guys in skills and you you, you use modifiers heavily yeah. Yeah. So they were in the Decoria data model. So we mm -hmm. had to put them in. Right. We had to basically we had to replicate exactly what the Decoria data model said. Right. And so we did. We had primary and secondary and all these things. Very rarely used. Right. And the reason is, I think that at this stage in the game, at least, people are interested in kind of more broad. Well, stuff right. High thing. level. So they're not really interested in dispense to prescribe. They just want to know, do they get the med or not? Mm -hmm. right? Now, later on, you know. In your I2B too. Yeah, then, then it, it, it can become more, you know, discriminatory. But, you, you know, it's interesting. So with all the hype we do sometimes about, you know, the detail and some of the other things, when it really push comes to shove, it's not, it's not as critical in the real world as we would think. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, other errors creep in and 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 swamp, you know, what we're trying to do. So that you know, it's not like whether it was prescribed or dispensed or whatever. It's you know, was a huge block of patients, you know, not even have meds fed in because the system changed and you know, I mean, that kind right. of thing, you know. So I don't know. I, I, I would say that uh, at the local level, we actually find this model are very useful. Mm. Uh, the network level, I would agree, we should start from the lowest uh, denominator right. to, to begin with. And maybe, depending on the use case, we can decide to add modifier which one to add. Uh, but I would say, for locally, we actually find modifier in our use case, at least the most sophisticated one. Right. Okay. So, you know, so we yeah, could. Right. Do that too, right? We can make it so that the shrine ontology does not have the modifiers and leave them in on the other one so that if people want to take advantage of that work that we've already done, they can use it in their local um, without it causing a problem, right? Yeah. And that's again why I want you to make sure you have two on sets of ontology tables. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <Tip>. <laughs> so. Oh, do I want to say what I want? <laughs> that is a modifier. Hello, that's a modifier group. So a modifier, and, and that's an, oh no, that's another thing. Um, a modifier is like primary diagnosis versus secondary diagnosis. And so when you drag it from, you know, into the window, it's only going to get the facts that have that modifier column that matches what you drag, drug, dragged in. I don't know what the past tense is. So um, I don't have a real picture of it, though, but I'm guessing you guys know what modifiers are. So, okay, so, so the consensus kind of is we probably don't want modifiers in the shrine ontology, but we could potentially leave them in the local ontology but we will let you guys go back and vote for real because there's some people who aren't here that might be the whole modifier supporting contingent that aren't here and they might want to vote so um we'll we'll take that to the data harm group but i really think you guys should you know be a part of that data harm group and, and have your voice heard and and because or else it's just my voice <laughs> If you're not, if you're interested, I mean, I've heard a lot of our members, I haven't really talked much at all yet, so if this is new to you, um, send me an email. I own all of those meeting invitations left with me, so I'm happy to add you to the group. And then um, I think a lot of you have my contact information, but if not, I will leave my cards over on that table back there. So when we break for lunch, feel free to pick up a card and send me a note either for um you know if you're if you're interested in participating in our monthly uh data organization work group calls and if you have anything you'd like to take back to the group anything you want to make sure you don't lose or forget uh in the interim send me a note and i'll make sure that we keep track of that
Okay, so I kind of got the ontologies down to a science at this point. All of this pausing and going back and forth allowed me to rewrite this over and over and over again. So basically now I have whittled it down to two scripts. One script that can pretty much generate any I2B2 ontology from UMLS, as long as there's a hierarchy in the MR hire table. And the other is the MED ontology, which I do use RxNav API to build. So, um, so this is what our new ontology has in it. It'll still have the same demographics, the ICD-10 and 9, the old small, um, like hand curated laboratory set of tests, the old visit details. We will add a new ICD-10 tree. We modified the ICD-9 tree so it looks a little bit different. It just We've moved the codes to the front so it sorts by the code instead of alphabetically. Um, we have this full lab link list um, that we use the, um, so it's from UMLS. It uses, I think, the multi-axial hierarchy that Link puts out. And then we have the drugs by product ingredient, and then the drugs by the VA class. Um, ICD-10 procedures, the CBT-4s, the HIGS-6, and ICD-9 procedures. So I think I just did a couple of the ones that are new. So this is kind of what the CPT-4 looks like. It's sorted alphabetically. If you want to complain about that, now's the time to do it. I can put the code in front. I mean, we've played with all different things to try to see what formatting was easiest for people to look them up. I don't know, from a physician's point of view, do you know CPT codes like you know ICD-9 codes? So alphabetic probably is a little bit easier. Although when you're searching, I actually probably would go to find the terms way. Um, CPT, uh, picks, picks, same thing. Um, this is the lab. So I would say this probably needs the most work because the hierarchy kind of just drops off into all these things which might um, be more than we need. Um, so I think Deb and People are going to have to figure out what the pro proper hierarchy will be for this. But this is our baseline. I think from this, we might be able to get some kind of um, um, data characterization to see what, what codes are actually being used and, and uh, you know, what data we really have and how we can really gather stuff together. But that will be up to the data harm group. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think for in the general case, when you're just measuring presence or not presence, you can pull one of these higher level folders. There might actually be a folder below for me you can pull a higher level folder and the query should work because it'll have all of the codes that are, you know, all the versions of A1C underneath mm -hmm. them. The problem only happens when you query by value where you will have to put in all versions of that lab. And like I said, if you work with the, I mean, the data harm group or the lab subgroup is gonna have to come up with how that can be best work with. I, I, I don't really have any opinions on it. I don't know how to, any ideas how to improve that. Um, and then these are the two um, med ontologies. We added this one with the products by ingredient. We added the NDCs and then you'll see there'll be like retired um, cooies that'll be integrated with the tree. Um, so hopefully we will have captured the historical, the problem where we had people who had, you know, older coded things that the CUIs changed. Um, I hopefully caught those. So we'll, again, I will have to do a little bit more characterization on it and see what my coverage is and make sure that I got it. And then, so from the 
SD level on down or S, no, SCDF level, which is like this the injection or oral tablet level, these two will should look about the same because I use the same script to generate it. So, but this should have more in it than what's just in the VA formulary, which that one, the um the, the drugs by class should. Um, that's what's in that tree. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I do some capitalization in there. So <laughs> but yeah, so these are just pipelines. Um, and then this was just again, when you're doing the installation of the ontology, just to stress two separate things. You can put some other things in your ontology tables at the local level. I think there's a lot of tricks and things that people do. I don't know if it's Robert Bradford. Oh, that's you. I should have known it was you. I think he has some tips and tricks of how he handles his. There's somebody else who has some other tips and tricks. And hopefully during the second half, people can kind of share some of those things with everybody that you know, some more people who are more novices could learn from um, to map, you know, do some mappings where you don't have to do full copies of your data set over and over, stuff like that. Um, and then just to, we are pretty much saying do the adapter mapping one-to-one. -one. I think it just seems a little bit easier to keep track of and debug to actually change your local ontology tables versus this file because this is a text file and it, it could get a little bit unruly. Yes, it'll work. Yeah, no, 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 not that it won't work. We just, you know, just, we just want to make sure that this one stays clean. Okay. Right, right, right. So, and there's a lot of different ways that people are approaching it. So I, I think it'd be cool to hear all the different ways that people are approaching it. Some people have some side mapping tables that are doing in an over top of a view. So I think it'd be interesting to hear how those are happening. Um, and then, oops. So we did the red cap survey with the wave one and two sites answered the questions. And then we added a bunch more questions and we are submitting it to the wave three sites. Um, Philip did a lot of work uh, on this and he actually pulled together these spreadsheets. Um, so we're using these for a bunch of different things. One of the things that we're using the survey results from, so the survey is really important because it's going to help us to build that user facing information to let people know where things are missing, you know, you have some idiosyncrasies at your site. Is your site special? Is it just a children's site? So people shouldn't expect certain data. Um, how often um, your data gets updated, what year your data starts. So these, this data is going to feed into what the dissemination group are going to put together for the users to see. Um, then, um, Philip also did a lot of work to use the information to help people kind of debug their site. So he went through and, you know, put the spreadsheet together and you can see like right here, this person had, you know, 157,000 um, people with diabetes in their EMR, pretty much the same in their I2B2, but then they dropped all the way down to 32,000 in their shrine. So, so Philip worked with some of the sites to try to help them to debug like what's going on with their data. So this also to help you at a technical level. And then, and then this example, it shows you like, here's the modifier, there you go. There's a couple people that are returning with modifiers, but you can see most people are just not doing it. So, um, that's it. Any questions? Cool. All right.
So yeah, thanks, Mark. So um, we're like right back on time, which is just I'm so excited right now. Um, we're gonna break um, here in a second and then regroup at two o'clock for this part two of our second session today. But Mark, why don't you walk us through yeah. some of our lunch options? Let's do nothing in the area. So we are here at the library. Down there, you came in right there. There is a place called Paths that is actually basically in the Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, entrance is right there close to the front door. It's like a counter service, like sandwich shop, like a well seasoned flat top grill if you're looking for something like that. Um, there's a, a food truck over there in that little circle. There's a Bologna, which is burritos, et cetera. Um, in that building, that's marked parking. And then there's um, over here in the Longwood Galleria, there's sort of a food court with, with fast food types of options. Uh, so those are some of the things around for lunch. And they exit the Courtyard Cafe too? Or? I, so these, yeah, there are a couple of places. I think you need an ID. I think they expect uh, you to have an ID for that. Yeah. So find a friend. Go yeah, back. you can also find a friend to go to one of those. And then if this is any easier, that's a, sort of an aerial view. So we are up there. In this box, that's food trolley, a logo gallery. All right, awesome. Cool. Thanks, Mark. We'll see everyone again at two o'clock. Folks who are joining us, we're going to pause and then start back up. All of us will take medicine. Hi, my name is Louisa. I'm from the Bishop. All right, Mark Abaja. Applications leading for clinical research from the University of Southern California. Wave four. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sean. Hello, I'm Mahesh Sangala. I'm a data scientist at UMass Medical School. Susan Kawasi, a physician and epidemiologist from Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, Matt Bauman, developer at Northwestern University. Rob Shaw, OHSU. I'm Lisa Bachi, same OHSU data analyst. Jeff Plan, I work with John Lindsay, and I'm also a data analyst by college at the University of Southern California. Hi, I'm Sarah Hall, I'm a data analyst at the University of Southern California. I'm also a data analyst at the University of Southern California. I'm the I'm the I'll come on over here to our shrine table. Oh, um, I'm Mark Cerrillo, who introduced myself earlier, project manager here at Harvard Labs. I'm working with Sam and Doug. Sam Troy, uh, part of the shrine team as well over at Harvard University. And uh, a lot of you have heard my name. So, I'm going to get back to the power channel and see if you can do Sam Connolly, a developer at the University of Kansas. Uh, I'm part of the 
That was helpful and helpful for me. Nice to meet everybody. So I'll turn it over to Jay and talking about productionalizing your act instance. So. <laughs> was it space bar? You go to the next one. Oh, okay, great. Oh, so my name is Jay, and um, we have an inside view of i2b2 so today we're going to point you to the resources that we've developed uh that will allow you to do some um, make productionize your um, act instance i'll go into more detail so basically like here once you once you're all set up with i2b2 and um you've got an ontology it's now now you're ready to let some users um into your site but to some considerations before uh, what do you do about user registration? What do you do about the terms of access that's dictated by ACT, uh, securing your platform, you know, your website, uh, and refreshing your data? Uh, so there's a lot, probably a lot more considerations, but these are the ones we were focusing on today. Uh, registration. Uh, these are like what mandated by ACT again, local ACT users must register to use the software, which is the i 2 uh, Shrine web client. Users must be faculty members or fellows qualified staff working with faculty members. Uh, local sites must come up with their own methods for handling registration. These may be like electronic or manual or a combination. Um, the example we give on our, on our wiki is electronic, automatic. Um, and also the, these methods must include auditing, who has tried to register, who has registered, and who has logged in, you know, who's accepted the terms of access. Any clarifications needed for, yes? No, so, um, so uh, as a, a node on the X network, we're responsible for registering our own users. We have our own user base. There's no such thing as a centralized act registry, no. no. No, so yeah, this is this is this is kind of like what we came across, and like okay, now we we're responsible for our own site, so like this would be good to share um, with the rest of the sites. Good question. Any other? Uh, yeah. Um, so if I'm trying to register a database, I'm going to have to know about the person who issued it. Do they have to go have any training or anything? Um, like, like specific. Oh, so it could be a monkey at the other side. Well, you do have to be a qualified faculty or a designee of a qualified faculty member performing queries 
okay. under their supervision. Like but there, there are some sites um, who do mandate a training prior to actually being given access to the tool. I don't think that's a bad idea, but it's up to the local site as to how they actually can. can so there's a fact policy about calls like that. There is, correct, yes. Access to Shine queries, you need um, data arrogant data limit data set. As far as length, I, I, that might be site yeah. specific, right? Site specific, we would recommend a year because understanding that investigators aren't always going to, they're not going to be using it on a regular basis per se, right? So we don't want to run into the frustration of, you know, say their access is denied if they don't log in after 90 days. Well, having a year before that times out is, is appropriate and setting out reminders. We've implemented something similar at Pitt, if you have um, any questions there, but we'd recommend you know, allowing, um, uh, keeping the, the user active for a year um, without use before they're actually made inactivity to go through the process again. Yeah, there's one, one level of access control for a shrine work obviously much more so Somebody was on top of her. 
So we can share the recordings and that data steward training. And Mark did a really good job of walking through some examples. And like Michelle said, we don't have any real data yet, but the examples are useful. So I can share that out um, following the day's event so that you have that as reference. And something that um, Wave Free Sites will be gearing up to do as well before we release to end users another um, data steward training. Yeah, uh, just the comments about the apparent uh, acceptance of students uh, as a use of here. My memory was that earlier on that wasn't maybe a um, uh, use case that we wanted to support, but I do kind of think it's legitimate to make sure our language in the various documents actually includes students. Yeah, you're right. So I know we talked about residents too. So. Um, and you'll see, we'll talk about the terms of query access here, but um, again, something that will continue to, to evolve and that we'll need to refine. So there's obviously plenty of gray areas as we go through and we think about um, you know, what it means to be a uh, qualified staff working under a qualified faculty member. So thanks, Rob. Thank you. Dr. Mark, could you comment on the ability to turn the auto topic approval on or off and whether or not that's something that should that they get related to the, yeah so auto approval at this, at this point at this juncture it will be configured to set auto approval on Correct. so sites so individuals using the network will have to create a query topic again we're suggesting that people include enough information there that someone who's looking at their query behavior can make some sort of determination but that will be approved automatically as opposed to waiting for someone to approve it right so why why would a site want to turn the auto approval off? Why would they want to do this? Um, I guess that would what that would allow the site to do that is to actually have a, a point to approve the query topic <laughs> manually to say, you know, is this something that is understandable to the data stewards and then design. The point I was trying to make is that there's yeah. a level of additional security should a site desire to do that. Yeah, I think we got to the point where we were having a lot of trouble with getting query topics that were sufficient. The training wasn't significant enough, or people just were not understanding. You could make a step on a site by site basis. Yeah, or then it works if you're user experience, you need a data steward with this same thing. Right. And it's, you know, MEG is in there, it ends up taking a few days for it to get approved. You know, that's just that, that's a usability and a timeliness issue. But it's an option within the software. Um, so, we made a generic user registration page um, and we made it available using um, features that are already available in I2B2 um, that you have at your instance at your web, your I2B2 Shrine web client has this feature. And basically um, we make service calls to the PM cell to register a user, add the proper roles, and even um, sync up with your Active Directory um, users. 
Um, so they can use the same um, username password to get into the, to the Shrine web client. Um, and we publish this on the I2B2 community uh, wiki publicly. Uh, you, if you go to the main page, you sort out, look at the app software, um, you'll see the, uh, well, before that, um, here's an example of this generic form. And these are like the, uh, basically the three fields required by the PM cell for a user registration, just their username. This is kind of grayed out because we took it from the current user Active Directory, so they can't change it, email address, and their full name. And they would just click on the complete registration form. Again, all this, all the guidance on the software is in the wiki on, how, on what these forms are and how to do them. Um, but if we complete the registration, an email will go up to the site administrator saying this person tried or was successful in registering, and, they, and the user would get a welcome email saying, welcome to the shrine, here's the URL. Yes, if you if you want to know how to in PHP where to grab the current user login, um, which sometimes is from Active Directory or a local directory access protocol, mm -hmm. um, and then you could even pre-fill the email address and the full name. Um, you can let them change that if they want, but we just make sure that they don't change their login if you want to sync. Yeah, and again, all the deets are in the uh, in the wiki. Um, so here's here's a screenshot of the wiki um, that shows you how to create. It is a publicly available, and we go over the uh, XML signatures of the request request response uh, of all the service calls needed to to get a user to register, and and we also give code samples, code snippets of PHP of calling those services, and the down we have a download example as well fully working um, it comes with the configuration file you configure in your prime your pm cell url and other things like that um, and again it it will work if you have php installed and um and, and the late but you know a, a shrine web client there's no extra software needed Yep. For the user registration, if we want to do it manually and give people um, access, for example, only if they had a certain kind of account, would they be able to log in with Chivalent? I'm not sure what, what that is. It's like our university, we have single sign on. Okay. So you use that, and if we could tie that single sign on to the act shrine login, then our users who are approved to do so would be able to log in with their regular credentials. I'm not sure. Yeah. You, there, there isn't an act login. You, you yeah. make some kind of local determination, and then all the other end of the query knows is that some person from your site make a query. They don't know who it is. All right, so Mike, Mike is it here, so let me explain how this works in I2B2. So in I2B2, the project management cell allows you to have kind of a number of different schemes for holding usernames and passwords. One is it's just got a straight table of usernames and then just a hash password. So you can just create manually all your users and all your passwords, and that's one way to authenticate your users. The second way is that you can link it to Active Directory, so Microsoft's Active Directory, LDAP, um, and maybe Shibboleth. And if you can't, you could probably easily get it to do it. I, I can't remember if we do it. Mike is here. Yeah, there was some discussion for him. Here he is. He coming? So Mike would know. Do you guys know? Do you know? You know. There's, there's Shibboleth discussion before. There was. Yeah. It's, not it. it's not built yet, or is it built? Is there a Shibboleth connector? It's been done. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if the, the car supports it, but I know that. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't know about that. He's a Shibboleth co op. He's like open up, open up, open up, open up, open up. Similar features, but nothing. Yeah, it just announced to a straight username and password. I just, uh, uh, authentication. So basically, I mean, so you can go basically to an outside site, but you have to be 
either have it already built into the ICD2 software, which I know we have it for LDAP and I'm not sure about similar. I don't think it was officially done. So Mike may have been playing with it, but from the documentation of QA standpoint, yeah. it wasn't. Thank you. Okay. I think you so, did it for the fire, I think the fire path, copy square. Oh, you yeah, did copy to it? Yeah, for the OAP. You guys did it for the OAP. I, I think she was like the same as the concept. Yeah. Where you authenticate Twitter, Facebook, Google, any third party is actually the extra authentication to give differential, they give you um, call back to allow the token and you use that token for the session. So that's why you use the authentication and the authorization is on your side. The user authorized to access the same piece on your side. Okay, good point. So the, the form though that Jay showed, I thought the one thing that, that I thought um, we should we should say over again, Jay, was that um, it relies on active directory, right? That specific form. My example does. Yeah. Um, uh, and one on here, like the one that, that you can go to and, and, and grab as an example of this it's active directory. Active directory. Okay. Um, yeah, so you if one you you set something called um, parameters, and one of the parameters would be your domain name controller, um, where that where that, where that address is, and, that, and maybe two more, and that's and then you're good to go. Right. Um, yeah. So so if you have Microsoft Active Directory, this works out of the box. The, yes. With the domain. Okay. With example, yeah. Yeah. Is anybody here actually going a single sign on? As I understood it, that's that's the assembly block. If, if, if your site is the link between several administrative and separate units, does anyone actually do that? Sorry, okay. Sorry. Um, I went back to the slide too because I forgot to mention that. When the PM cell service call will do the auditing of people trying to set up their users, so I wanted that 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 that's included with um, if you use this method. So these are the rules. Um, local app users must agree to the act terms of access before getting to the data. Um, a suggested terms of access doc has been provided by act. Um, and then local sites again must come up with their own methods of um, how, to, how to get this, this agreement to be signed by the users uh, electronically or manually. Um, and then, of course, the auditing uh, terms of access can be can be tweaked per site depending on their needs, and also um, each one's unique because certain grant numbers may go into the terms of access. So I want to clarify by tweet. So we have the, the, the app terms of query access, but some sites choose to add additional layer. Um, whether it's restriction or a, an additional layer to the app terms of query access, you can't go through and delete qualified staff or qualified faculty or anything along those lines. So that holds true, but a lot of sites prior to um, rolling it out to, you know, for, for um, their end users to sign on and, and uh, uh, say that they agree to them may add a couple of additional line items. And that's totally at the, you know, sites are, you're absolutely welcome to do that. And then another thing that I just want to mention is centrally, we don't need this information, but perhaps one of your users 
is found to be, you know, it's escalated to our, our act executive committee that there's a potentially malicious user or some malicious intent somewhere, then we may call upon your institution to show that yes, this person did sign off on the terms of query access. So um, just it, having that documented really saves us um, you know, from, a, from a government standpoint if anything like that were to happen. Um, so, again, being close to it, being to our partners, uh, there is a feature available now on at your sites um, to use the announcement feature to put in your term of, terms of access. Um, so basically, when you go to log into the Shrine web client, you'll get the terms of access on a dialog box and yes, I agree or no, I disagree. They click yes, I agree. Um, if they're logged in, that can be an, uh, an audit point. Like, yeah, this person logged in and they click, yes, I agree. No, um, I disagree, um, brings them back to a blank login box. Um, and they must accept the terms before uh, proceeding to the Shrine web client. And the details, again, are on the public wiki. Um, we went into great detail on how to do this, which is, uh, here's the end result for, for, for partners. Um, it's real basic HTML, and then your button, um, disagree, no disagree, are, are there. So basically a few divs, unordered list, and then the wiki, um, go step by step on, on how, to, how to do this with, with no tools really needed. Uh, basically you create a simple HTML. I kind of followed the Word doc and made it look like it using HTML. Some encoding, you have to get rid of the less than signs and stuff uh, and make it all in one line. Then there's a P, another PM service call um, that you feed this blob of HTML to and um, it checks off, turn on announcement and it works. And, and all, everything you need is in this, in, in this, in this guide that we wrote. So, this comes before or after they after they get their login, after they do that other thing you showed before. Right. So the, the terms this should be all set to go before you start letting users in. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, but, so what do we see first? Um. So once you mean once they're registered. No, that's what I'm trying to understand. Like, so, so they go. They, they see this first. Yeah, they see this first if they're not registered. Uh, they, they, and they, um, we, we, you know, we do some checks, uh, partners, are they an employee, stuff like that. Um, you can, wherever your site rules are, you might want to extra validation. They click OK, they get an email. Um, next time they go to the registration page, they may be redirected to the Shrine web client for convenience. You can use one URL um, that does, um, you can test if they're registered or not, depending. It'll take them right to the Shrine web or to this registration page. So, yeah, good, good question though, yeah. Yes. Yes, each time, each, yes. That's why we decided to try it. Um, to, but that's it. Like I said, it's not, not mandated, but that's one way to do it. And we found this, this is very easy, um, even though they have to click, yes, I agree every time. Okay, another question. Um, is it possible, could you use, I'm just thinking, if we'd ever want to. So, okay, site so has this set up, the user agrees to the terms of query access. Would it ever be possible to configure an additional pop up, like in case we have a network outage or a downtime or something else we want to advertise? Is there the ability to have two separate pop ups, or is it something that you would just have to configure? I don't know if so you have everything all within, uh, right? Just in one box. Oh, like, okay. All diagnoses are disabled today. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 and then like, yes, I agree. I, <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. And I assume it's being driven off the PM table, right? Yes. So the plus there's a list of them. Yeah. So the, the in the project management cell, there's a parameters file which controls all of these announcements. And it's just a table with like, you know, uh, announcement and then the text. Right? 
So you could do all kinds of fancy things like automatically update the table, you know, across the entire shrine network, for example. Um, but that would be something that app would have to invent in order to get that into the table. And then once it's in the table, it appears like this. Because all this is doing is just kind of digging it out of the table and putting it in the Good question. So a couple of last uh, thoughts. Um, this is something we had to go through to make this production ready as far as uh, um, to let users in. And we wanted um, the HTTPS and SSL certificate. And um, you may have to work with your network engineering team or your network server engineers, or you may be doing most of it depending on, on your roles and at each site's unique. Um, and they'll say like, oh, is it inward facing or outward facing? And if it's inward facing, they'll be like, oh, so you can use a wildcard um, certificate. I'm like, great. Okay, that sounds good. Um, but just the thing is, is these things take time. So make sure you get everything done before you, go, you announce you go live. Uh, also, um, get it done. You may want to get a domain name server entry for your um, for your for your apps shrine web client instance. Um, that way, your users have something easy to remember, or save it migrates to another machine. They just point to the, the domain name to another machine, and the users don't even know it. And it's better than trying to remember an IP address. And that that usually um, a day or two, um, depending on your network engineering's um, load. Um, and then user user accounts can be tied to organizational accounts. Um, and we kind of covered that with uh, with the code example above. Um, now, if you're doing it manually, like using the the, the administrator, I two B two administrator, make sure your shrine users only have data arrogant and data limited data set. The code sample to ha uh, handles that for you. Um, so you don't, if you use the code as an example, it won't give too many rights away. But if you're doing it manually, just something to think about. And yeah, that's that's it. Any questions on this? Yes, sir. Yeah. additional check and that is we make sure that they have that all of their responsible conduct for research all, all of their train, training is up to date and we don't let them in if they haven't had that uh, as well as you thought about doing anything like that um, that's, that's brilliant now <laughs> I'm not, not sure so the registration example Do you do it on each login or just user registration? Currently, we do it on I2B2 on our login. It's actually a little bit of a funky process, but it, it does affect it. It works every night. Um, actually, the way it works is we go in every night and disable all the accounts, run a check uh, on our Active Directory for their training statuses, and then re-enable everybody that um, that has current training. And then we catch people, because you have to have these annual refreshers and things like that. We catch people that fall by that one. That's really, that's really great to share. Thanks. Um, just two points here. 
on um, data refreshes uh, that you know, may be aware of. Um, the phase two software, with, uh, which is going to be discussed next by Boswati, um, in order for, for, for these plugins and this uh, phase two software to work, from each refresh, you need, we should keep your patient now cons consistent. Um, otherwise, historically, um, the, patient, the, the patient viewer won't work. Uh, also, um, if there's any breaks in the data structure or, on, or ontology changes, previous queries will not work anymore. And that's all I have, unless there's any questions. Yes, Texas. Just don't know, right? 
Any more open discussion? <laughs> <laughs> well, we heard a couple of things. We, we heard from you know, Rob, for example, something that you know, Berg is doing, but we're all at least our wave one and two sites. You're in the middle of having to think through, of like, okay, kind of a wake up call, right? If the act was on hold for a little bit, you already went through your technical install, then you actually had to think about what it was like to function in a true production network, thinking ahead and you know, releasing to end users. So I know that. You know, all of us, I speak for all of our wave one and two sites, but it's been a, it's been a, it's a lot more than just saying, hey guys, Axe ready for use, here's where you go to register, right? There was a lot that we had to think through before we were able to do that. So I think it's going to be helpful, you know, still to our wave one and two sites and also our wave three and four sites if they're thinking ahead to this. You know, what were some of the, the areas that you had to consider that just weren't front of mind or what are some things that you found to be really useful as you're prepping to roll out to end users? Or where are there still gaps? Where are you really confused and you feel like you're just not clear on, um, on how to do something and you know, are a little bit hesitant before we roll out to end users? So I would love to hear from the, from the group. Or everyone has it down and nothing to worry about. This is on autopilot now. <laughs> Uh, I'm, uh, I might be getting ahead of myself here, but I go ahead and ask it anyways. Uh, so, how does pharmaceutical companies be part of it? Because they're not data providers, right? But they do make use of clinical cohort exploration, which is trying to build for. Um, is there a, a plan in the future to make them as part of the stakeholders? No, not in the next couple of years. Yeah, not in the duration of this of this grant. Good question. So, uh, yeah, there's a slightly grayer answer to that question. I like binary answers. <laughs> uh, certainly, a pharmaceutical could approach uh, investigators. Um, and or the PIs um, act and that's it that went Yeah, we you right. Yeah. I haven't built a door yet. Right. I'm going to use this time to ask a personal question that I'm fighting through right now. So uh, we are in the process of figuring, we just set up a new IT instance that we used to have a separate we said things much more separated, but we're going to have the IPv2 instance serving both the Shrine, our internal users, and the, the Shrine network. Um, and wondering with LDAP authentication, because our goal is to have simple LDAP authentication for the uh, IPv2 instance, but then um, something a little bit more complicated for the Shrine instance. So when you set up that LDAP, authentication, do the users just get, you have user records created within the I2B2 um, user records, and then you control that by project, or um, what are the pitfalls I need to be looking for in the next month as I send this up? So, um, think of LDAP as a very simple username password authentication protocol. All the authorization questions, you know, what project is the person in, what access do they have, you know, do they have limited data set access, you know, are they a manager? All of that is in a table in the project management itself. So that's all the same, whether it's LDAP or you know, a straight, you know, type piece of advantage uh, using a password. It's always all that authorization. Stuff is in project management. And the only thing, oh, 
sorry. Is there a way in like the admin um, menu to go in and say when someone authenticates with help the app set them up with this type of use? Or is it yeah. I have to go in with each single user and give them the access that they should have? Um, each single user, they won't be able to get into IP2 held up or, or not until you put the in. Okay, and when you put it in, you'll say LDAP. And then it'll know to go to LDAP to get the authorization, authentication. So okay, okay. it's just, just doing the authentication. I still do the thing. You're still doing all the Okay. There's nothing cool like they can just tell that group and say everybody. Nothing cool like that. Not okay. <laughs> That's what I was hoping for. So I guess I. Well, so it's the same user technology, different privileges for. Yes. 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 I have a follow up question for the gentleman. Um, so you said I2B2 and Shrine Act being served by the same I2B2 host? It's the same database. Yeah. Same database, so the same PM cell. Yes. So but then you would have people walk. So as a, as a user, I would have one user account for logging into IGB2 and a different user account for logging into the Shrine at Shrine. Is that right? I think you assign it in a user brand or something. There's some table where you can tell it which um, projects it has, the user has access to. Access. Yeah, so you only have to set up the user once and then you assign the user to. So Shrine would be considered a project and IGB2. And the only the only kind of caveat that, that we didn't really mention was this is that if you want to make sure, so let's say that the same user has access to the shrine and the same user has access to the IP, you want to make sure that they are directed to the appropriate web clients. So even though it's using right. the same shared PM, but then it's just worth mentioning. So if they're using the shrine in one or two better queries, they use the correct shrine web client and vice versa. Because they can actually log in the whole frame to the I can take you with questions. So one of the big problems is just this map. I don't think, but in other networks, when you link back to the ICD2 PM cell out of the box, it comes with a default domain. Make sure you change that domain because Shrine uses the combination of username and domain as a, as a user identity down the works. We have one network where two different sites are using the default domain. And that yeah, the area when someone moved from one hospital to another one was account still works. You can see all the previous queries and the And it's a really hard problem on the line. And uh, just a quick comment is that we can follow up to your answer your question, uh, follow up to your comment, which was a kind of situation in maybe one of this two, uh, where you got two different well, or two different applications uh, that look very much the same. Um, and I'm wondering if you know, could somehow style uh, act to be a little bit different. So it's very unmistakably clear. Not clear to us, but right. I think Michelle suggested that. Yeah, okay, very good. Yeah. I, get, I get confused though. I don't remember where, but there's a there's a specific way that we're all through all these get to the uh the yeah. can, can you can you, can you have do you know how to do that? Can you tell us how to do that? Can you write it down? Is there a keep looking? I mean, could we is there a way that we could configure the shrine web content for landing page upon login with? 
an ad, just the app logo or something, would that be sufficient just on the login page and a differentiator from I2B2? And then at least know where you're. You have to use background color too. Oh, you change yours? In, in related scenarios, yeah. So you could write it down. Yeah, I know it'd be great because we all are struggling with like, I mean, I do it all the time and I have two different logins and the key names are different. So, I would love to know. So, so he is, who is he? Dan Conley, can you write it down for <laughs> Yes. Okay, but it, but it sounds like, and, and yeah, we we definitely heard this before. I've heard it, I think, primarily from Michelle every single time I'm begging Michelle for help with something. Um, so it sounds like if we, because this, this would all be done local, right? This would be local configurations for everyone to modify their, their web clients. So if we would agree. So we could do it. So we could do it just for app. Okay. That way, we whether it is background color or a logo or some sort of differentiator, so we can do that and then, all right, maybe. And then maybe what we could do is the one of these upcoming trying updates. It just comes with it. What do you think? Also, we just said like an act specific distribution of the trends. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, yes. Correct. Yeah. So I guess the most straightforward or instruction that go right. with the act installation. Right. Right. Because that's the most straightforward place to put it. It's the how to install trying for act. Right. Right. Yeah. We're going to find it anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it doesn't know making those changes is kind of about like hacking it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, um, no, that's a, a deterrent, but it may not be as simple as if we sort of bake that in as a configuration. Right. Yeah. But I mean, that's probably the, that's all I can say about that this time. I mean, I mean, that's clean. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's just suggesting some things I think we could look at from a default try and install that makes, make them call it app, but it would make them clearly make a distinction between a shrine or a client that. Yeah, I think that's all it would be like. Our users are going to be like. Yeah, there's also, yeah, there's images and stuff we could make. Yeah, it's close. Right, right. right. And this would essentially solve the problem. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Where to come? Yeah. Okay. So, um, there was a gentleman earlier today who was speaking about something from the Netherlands and European <laughs> sponsors and stuff like that. And I thought to myself, hmm, does that mean that IPv2 and Shrine are localized? And are there localized versions? And if I wanted to create a localized version, how would I do that? I mean, not for USC, but for something else. Do you mean like branding it? No, I mean, like, uh, that's, 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 that's a different language. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
a month. Mm -hmm. The workbench, though, I would only use in Windows. Not in the Mac. Oh, not the, not the Mac one? There's a, a I'll another one. Yeah, oh, yeah. All right. So we've talked a lot about history of ACT, what ACT is, what you can expect, what you're doing right now, 2018. Are there any other questions related to any of the discussion so far before we transition into the future? I don't know if this is from my experience to some of the other developers um, later on, but I had questions just about very low level, the best ways to, I mean, how do you choose what kind of hardware you want for your virtual machine, for example? Um, when we make, um, what about when I have I2B2, I need to go in and make adjustments to the .xml files before I deploy them into a wireless line? And do I want to put those under version control? Is there a recommended way of approaching that? And so I just have a number of questions as a developer and implementer about best practices for that kind of thing. Sure, so I know that Sam and Mark spoke a little bit to some of that during our webinar a week or two ago. I also know there's plenty of information on both respective wikis. And I would also recommend, I think most of the folks in this room um, wouldn't disagree that feel free to use the distribution list, the ACT Tech DH, if you just want to query out to the group and try to get an understanding as to what other sites have, have done and what's been useful for them. You'll at least get a couple of responses back, but I'll turn it over to the group for any additional, you know, Places to go for some guidance and best practice. So I get a lot of the impression from this, like this can be taken offline for further discussion. For version and control, uh, as I mentioned before, I think Robert Bradford from UNC, they exclusively use Jenkins to deploy their software. So Jenkins has a template versioning system. So you make changes to uh, an XML file or a config file. It keeps track of that and then you can basically slash and burn you know destroy your whole environment and then rebuild and redeploy everything so that's a particular piece of software that you can utilize uh, we at hms use the ansible uh, to deploy things uh, from local to cloud or local server so uh, we also have version systems there uh, bring it to something like bitbucket or github and so that's a good way to track changes made to your configurations or other files um, and then you know going down the line you know a, a lot of sites are starting to explore container systems like docker and stuff like that and i think docker hub also has a versioning system as well so you can utilize a whole variety of tools to uh, deploy your software or to make changes and there are mechanisms for you to roll back in case something fails you know uh, and then i think yesterday um, Splunk was mentioned, so Splunk is like logging software, so that could be utilized in conjunction with these configuration management systems to troubleshoot errors or to basically log all of your activities. So, um, but yeah, as Elena said, like, we can open this up to see what people are using at their particular sites, and um, you know, however we can make things more efficient or remove some pain points that'll be good to hear from everybody. And also when we kick off with our wave four calls and we'll meet probably bi-weekly, we will have, you know, these wonderful folks that you've been hearing from today on the line as well. And you know, partners can speak to what partners done, Pitt can speak to what Pitt has done. So hopefully that provides some some guidance as well. Cool. All right. Let's see here if we can turn it over to Aswati to talk to us about, um, I know we've, we've mentioned a lot, Vivian's mentioned a lot about the plugins and participant identification. So now we're gonna hear all the fun details from Aswati and Vivian. Mm -hmm. Right, so as we promised, alluded to, intimated, threatened, <laughs> we're gonna talk about phase two, and we're going to talk about some new tools that are going to get people from phase one, where you just have an aggregate account that's returned in the Shrine web client, and now you're at your local site and you want to do something. 
So we already talked about these aims. I'm not going to go over them again, but what I was going to point out is that we're talking about aim three right now, enabling identification uh, locally. So here's my use case that I talked about this morning. That's taken a little bit further with Parkinson's and tobacco use. It's been studied for a while, and now it's at the level where a group in France was looking at the genes that are involved. And they actually found nine uh, SNPs. They, they ended up with 513 people who had Parkinson's disease and a bunch of controls. They found nine SNPs. They then were able to verify that two of the SNPs are significant. And so they want to go further. And they're not using ACT, but this is somewhere uh, that ACT could be, in a case like this, that ACT could be useful because they did state in their paper that they really needed more power and they needed, and they are going to do multi-site uh, trials with people across Europe. So we're using this as our use case today to kind of talk about our tools. And so we've talked about this a lot. We're in phase one. Right now, a PI can run a query and can get aggregate counts. And we showed this this morning. This is the query being run. These are the counts being returned. And uh, you know, we thought, OK, if you need over 200 people at each site, then you have at least four sites that satisfy that criterion. And so now I'm going to hand it over to Baswati and she's going to tell you about these plugins that we've been working on. Thank you, Vivian. Good afternoon, everyone. So, phase two, you have been hearing a lot about it all day, and let's get to it now. What is it? Uh, so, according to the app software, here we are now in phase one. We have our Shrine and I2V2 installed. A PI or any app user can run a query that goes around all, all the sites connected and gets back the result as aggregated counts um, to the user. We are partners are making some plugins that will go on top of your um, I2V2 installation. And these ITV2 tools will help you identify potential research subjects. And when these, um, these plugins added on top of your ITV2 web plan, this whole software deck from phase one, this will move, this will enhance to phase two. The tools are able to do, they will help you find a network query locally. They will help you find local patients for those network queries. You, can, you will be able to review and filter patients. And finally, you will be able to export the list of patients for recruitment. And uh, I'm going to explain them in my following slides. Um, but before that, let me discuss about flagging a little bit more. Um, so many of you may be already familiar with flagging feature in Shrine. It's, a, it's existing functionality helps you uh, label a query. Um, so, as Vivian showed you, uh, the Parkinson and tobacco use um, query, API running that. There may be a few attempts before he comes to the optimal one, okay? Uh, I think Sean mentioned it before, um, that the query criteria, it cannot be too strict that you get so less uh, patients for your trial, you cannot uh, work with that. It cannot be too liberal, then you will get a lot of false positives. So it's necessary to get to the optimal one. And PI tries to get to that one. And when he or she is satisfied that this, this query uh, is the one that gives him sufficient patience for different sites that he's interested in, then he will go here in the previous query section in his Shine web client. It doesn't actually move. Okay, so he will go, he will find his uh, final query in the previous query section and right click on here and select flagging that will bring that dialog box. Now, the message there, I put, it's a very generic one, but a PI can put a very meaningful message there. And when he clicks OK, 
that meaningful message goes across all the app sites again so that the other app sites know that this is something they want to have uh, they want to work on they have to take action on and after the flagging is done you can see the pi will see this icon here changes to this that's an indication that the flagging has been completed so after the flagging is done, there comes these uh, plugins, ITB2 plugins that users will use at their local sites. The plugins are trying to ITB2 uh, connector, patient reviewer, and patient list export. Trying to ITB2 connector. Sean mentioned about it. Uh, you saw uh, how it looks like. So this gives you a unique view into Shrine queries from being within your ITB2 web client. You don't have to uh, look through all the previous queries to find one. This, uh, this tool will help you. This will give you that in the view. And you will be able to find the network query that you are interested in, and you will be able to create a patient set using this tool. This is how it looks like. And ACT is in, um, still developing the network. Uh, so when it's fully developed, there will be 60 plus websites, uh, 60 plus app sites, and so many, we believe it will be very busy, so many network queries coming in and running against your local site, so many flag messages and things, how will you find your query? This, is, this gives you a view into all flag queries and ordered in the, according to their time of execution, and not only the created a time and the name that you already can see in previous queries but it will give you an idea about who actually ran the query and from which side if the domain name of the shrine site was set up properly you will be able to see that yeah bg845 ran a query from pa uh, partners and there goes the flag comment if you're not sure um, um if you were looking for a flag or unflag go ahead there is this checkbox, if you uncheck it and click start again, this will bring all the queries um, that were flagged or unflagged. You will look, if you know what query you are looking for, uh, to provide the name there, or if you know which user you just put there and search it, it will bring you, it will help you pinpoint the query. So the user ID is now passing through the user from the shrine, right? Um, instead of it showing the service account it's showing the actual right right user. so yeah you cannot this is the only tool that will give you this information this information is there but you need some expert to give you that information but this tool gives you all this information at your disposal yeah there is no other tool in itv to right now that does this uh, this is a list of flag queries in the network. Mm -hmm. Is this available to any user at any site? Uh, no, this, this is depends on how much access you have. So user, ITB user needs a manager role to get to this. Yeah. Okay. So once you can point what query you are interested in, you will click on view and run. And this is a query you saw PI ran into in his Shrine web client, and now it is into your ITB2 web client. And I will just quickly mention about this work list here that differentiate between, I know people are thinking about color coding and different things, but this little section here, this only belongs to ITB2 web client. It, it's not present in Shrine web client. Anyway, so now it is here in your web client, in your ITB2 web client, and there is a prompt that was returned as a result of the query. And at this point, it's still just an aggregated count. You need actual patients to work with. How to do that? It's easy. You just hit the run query button there. You have to basically read on this query in your ITV2 web client, in your ITV2 environment again. So when this uh, dialog pops up, check on the patient set and run it again. When you run it, the patient set will be generated. It will create a new query for you, and you will be able to find it here again in the previous query section. And you'll see the name, whatever name you put there, you'll see that name, and the new patients will be attached to uh, that. So using ITB2, uh, trying to ITB2 connector, now from an aggregated count, you have come to an actual set of patients. Okay, what's next? So, you know, 
even the PI tries his best to come to the optimal query, there are still chances that there are some false positive. Uh, so many times a patient goes to run a test just to rule out a condition, but because the test was run, it stays in his medical uh, record and chances are that he shows up in uh, related queries. So there will be still uh, false positive and wouldn't it be nice if you could look into the patient's data one patient at a time and make sure yeah, that patient makes the criteria or does not. Patient, set, uh, patient reviewer plugin is meant for that. It will help you review the patients in a tabular structure of data, one patient in a row, and it will help you filter out those who you think do not meet the criteria. This is how patient reviewer plugin looks like. It has four sections. The first section uh, helps you uh, structure the, um, in the format in which you want to see your patient's data. So um, you will just drop your uh, the query that you created your, in your uh, previous example using the shrine to identity connector, and then you will be able to structure it the tabular format. Uh, you, can, you will be able to download the patient's table, uh, tell about it a little, um, a little bit. Uh, you will be able to designate a workplace. So what is workplace folder? Um, when you review the patients, you need to save them somewhere. Where will you save them? So workplace folder will help you with that. And then um, the last section will actually show you the patient's data. So this is how it looks like when you drop your uh, query. You drop your query, it brings the concepts associated with it. And in addition, we also give you some extra uh, de uh, details that we thought would be meaningful for you for these uh, review purposes. So it says Parkinson's disease, and then it says existence. It means what? That it's checking if this concept is present for this uh, patient, for the patient. Well, we already know there, yes, right? That's why they showed up. So that's not sufficient. Only looking for existence is not sufficient. So this tool also gives you some analytical tools too. We are giving you a bunch of aggregation options that you can choose from. Uh, like count will be very important in this case. The, count, the higher the count, chances are probably the patient actually has this condition. And as you can see there, you can look uh, for when it was the first time the patient ever was diagnosed with this condition, what was the last time, all different kind of ag aggregation this tool is providing you. Okay. Okay. Um, so here, what I'm showing, you do not have to your the data that you are reviewing. You do not have to be constrained within the only uh, uh, concepts that were associated with the original query. You can drag. Uh, you can explore these ontologies that Michel one is working on, and you can find any uh, ontology that you think will help you with the re review process. You could drag and drop in here in the concepts dialog box right there, and that will add that concept. And then you can go ahead and choose any aggregation options that are available for that. So this gives you a lot of flexibility what your review data will look like. And this is the workplace again. Um, uh, I created um, under my workplace folder, I created this Parkinson tobacco study just for this example. So if you are working with a clinical trial, you will go ahead and create a a workplace folder for yourself and just drag it to there. And that's, that's done, it's selected. And when you select some patients, it will be saved right inside that folder. And then when you hit the last area, this is how patient data looks like. It brings on 50 patients at a time. And uh, you can see all the data that you asked for. There's my um, the anti-Parkinson agent concept that I added, it brings on the even the dosage for the patient, depending depending on what uh, concept I have, uh, what aggregation I have chosen. Uh, there are the counts that I asked for, and then there is a date. Well, I go ahead. Thirty-four looks a good count. Just selected by clicking here. Another count. Okay, I selected here. Let's move to the next page, which is fifty-one to next fifty set of fifty patients. I go ahead and select it. Uh, select two more patients, and as you, in real time, as you 
keep checking on more and more patients, you will see them being added to the locus folder that you just had selected. This is where they are being selected. If you accidentally selected one you really don't like, go ahead and uncheck it. It will be taken care of from here too. Now, all this review process till now, it was all real time. You do not have that time, no worries. This is this a download uh, functionality will help you. You go ahead here and download the patient patient table. What this does, it brings all patient's data, not just 50 at a time, it brings all patient data into the tabular structure that you had chosen before, and you, you can save it on your computer, work on it at some later time at your convenience. So now we have a network query from, down from indication count, we have a more precise set of patients related for a trial. What's next? It's, you need to extract the patient identification. How will you contact, contact them unless you have their identifier? The patient list exporter helps you with that. And very simple, how it looks like, it gives you two options, um, two options for selecting your patient set. You could either use your precise, uh, more precise set that you just created using patient reviewer, or if you thought the other, um, the PI query was fine and what patient set was there, you are good with that. You just go ahead and select that query from the video section and you hit download patient list. And then the magic happens. <laughs> Depending what you have uh, in your database, of course, and uh, how much level of access you have, you will be given some or all of this uh, information provided to you. And there you go, you have patient's name, street address, give them a call. <laughs> I don't know how you want to uh, recruit them, but we give you everything you need uh, using these tools. Yeah, that's what I talked about, how much level of access um, you have. That's not really up to us. It's uh, with the um, governance team, I guess. Right. Yeah. So what we proposed from a workflow standpoint is that before you'd ever get to this information locally, you would have, you'd have a study and you'd have IRB approval before you'd ever actually go to this level of detail. Um, that is the one workflow that we are proposing at this point. It's sort of what I want to say. It makes sure that this process is only done by an honest broker of some sort and that it is not done by the investigator or herself. Um, but we are assuming, at least for now, that you know that it's it's a study, it's an approved study, and there's IRB approval before you actually get down to the identifier level. You don't have to have IRB approval to get this. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, our, in our version, what we do is that uh, when they when they actually click on the we, we ask them to enter our IRB or our PR number. Oh. And we have a mechanism that we are able to check if you give it a red IRB. And if the person is using that, uh, our team is part of that IRB. Oh, that's the study roster. Okay. Before we allow them to actually put it actually. Uh, and I know that's kind of a local function. We have that mechanism available to you. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes.
1.7.11, which includes um, things like, uh, so if you, uh, so you can, you can, in theory, and the slide might be about the show this, but I don't want to say it's not there. Sure about, I don't know. Oh, it's the last one. So, in other words, so you, can, you can do things like make this report by dragging over, you know, first name, last name, street, right? Just like any other I2B2 fact. And then, but what about all those folks that don't have access to this, number one, okay? And so we don't want them to even see this is even already there. So hiding that completely from them. On a, on a kind of is is one uh, enhancement we have to make that you can't even see a tree if you don't have certain permissions. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is um, we don't even want this in. So what we want to do is use the multi fact table strategy to put this in a totally different fact table that could live on a totally different server. And, and that way, uh, uh, Anybody who sees your regular ITV tool will only even see this stuff. It will only come in dynamically, you know, during the during this query process. Um, At this point, we operate on two different because we have our university and our UBMC is both separate. We actually don't have real time connectivity to um, name. So we have like all of our and our stuff lives in UBMC. And only on a desktop, only on a desktop. So I would have to write the software to take this list, move it to UPMC, and then re identify. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. exactly right. Uh, and, and just like Alex is, was wanted. So in that case, all I to be to do is spit out those so patient noms, just right. the blue column. Mm -hmm. Everything else it doesn't even know about. Right. And then in your next step, yeah. you would add the other stuff to it. Right. Yeah, I have a question about the step that involved pretty early on when you first uh, uh, bring out the flagged query of interest uh, and you showed the result count 250. Yeah, that one. Uh, yeah. So, this one? Uh, no, this one. That one. Uh -huh. So, at that point, I've now clicked on the prior screen. That query is now loaded into my local ITV2, correct? Mm -hmm. This is in yeah. The this is 251 in. that's displayed there is the result of the query that's run in the shrine. And, try, and you yeah, and the PI so agree um like obfuscated count there. It could be like 250 plus. Sure. Yeah, plus minus. Yeah. Then is it also true that what just came over is only a query definition and not a patient set, correct? Yes. Right. So, so here's a, and, and so what I'm doing this locally and now I'm rerunning that query. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's my question. In my local I2B2 instance, I'm probably going to have more patients there than I am going to have in my act instance. And because the primary use case and the sole use case is accrual of clinical trials, so I'm going to exclude people who are known to be deceased out of act. I don't want to recruit um, sure. deceased folks. Mm -hmm. For example, there may be other other reasons too, but I can't mm -hmm. think of any at the moment. My question is, when I rerun that query in this local instance, and rather than getting more data about the 251 that were selected in act, I'm actually going to get a different patient set. Yeah. Um, if it's only vital status that changes that number, that's probably okay. But I'm wondering if that was an explicit design decision not to bring over a patient set. So, okay, we have multiple, multiple numbers of uh, questions in here, but yeah. So the first one is, um, are you sure you don't want to use your app instance? Also, for as the I2B2 instance behind folks doing this patient selection process, be sure you know because because you could arrange it that way, right? That's now let's say you feel like you know I want to use don't want to do that. I want to you know put them in to the main I2B2 instance. 
And in that case, um, there was a design decision to allow folks to add stuff from their local I2V2 uh, ontology, recognizing that they might have far more in their local I2V2 than is in their app. Um, both patients and uh, uh, stuff, right, mm -hmm. about the patient. Yes. Yeah. So that then you can use, you know, all the stuff about your patient to help either add to the set or subtract from the set, you know, to get a better starting point. Um, so that was, so the answer is that, that yes, that, that was a design decision uh, that we made. Uh, now you're right that it could get pretty complicated. Yeah, our particular deployment has two separate I2B2 instances. Yeah, one that powers act and, and one that is our local instance. The reasons for that decision are that every place is like that. So how do they interact with each other? What's that? How do they interact with each other? They do not interact. There, there are two separate instances. So how are you getting the query from your app one into your local one? Uh, I thought that's what that plugin did. No, it's, it's doing it on your on the same the act I to be act I to be to extend. So you say go to your local I to be to that's your act local I to be to it's the I to be to screen of your uh, local you site you web at your local site. Well, if you have I can do web client instead of the shrine, but if I am saying I to be to okay, okay. The show of asking like that is what we were thinking exactly what you said. But you must move I, some over. But I was thinking, okay, but cool. if you did try to do it, it's going to change all the things. It's the service that's from the cross. I'm seeing you back. I see a new plug in here. Can you get it? I think you guys are all in here. You're going to be laughing across all your ideas. So in our case, you would not be able to use this plug in directly because we have it. Our, our act instance of I2B2, that's just the act ontology of it. That's right. Um, that's um, right. No, it only your two I2B2 instance and then inject the ontology. So you can take that query and export it, you know, select it out and then put it into your other database, but it's going to make an assumption that the paths. Are going to work on your other IGB2. That's going to be your problem. Yeah, that's going to be I do have that problem. <laughs> 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 so, Shell could actually fix that problem for me by just putting the concept of like her ontology in that ontology. Somebody will see it as an ontology, but it'll be the concept of the work. Oh, yeah. So, but it sounds like it's a good one. Frankly, when we start talking like this, there's so many that it's too complicated. The solution bell goes off, right? Yeah. And the idea is just using the act ontology instance everything to do this whole workflow. Yeah, seems you know that's we have more data movement yes. to do in that case. So, what, are you saying you don't put all your data into your actions? Correct. Our, uh, there were some reasons for early on when so we've had our I2B2 instance for quite a while. Mm -hmm. We made some early ontology decisions when uh, demo data was really supposed to be a demo ontology, and we made some decisions like, oh, age is numeric. We're not going to categorize age. We're going to have it be a numeric selector and use the uh, little X. Oh, the pop up up thing. Uh -huh. So. We have things like that. The mapper didn't work um, in the case of moving kind of a continuous variable into categories. So our decision when we implemented ACT rather than redoing all of our ontology locally, it was easier then, maybe not now, to just stand up a separate instance for ACT and have only the data elements that were part of the ACT ontology in that separate I2B2 instance. So I've got basically two I2B2s. It was easy. Well, so I I was I we were copy cut and paste. It's a good time for us to relook at that because we, for other reasons, have to reduce the ETL. So um, perhaps that's not the best design pattern now. 
Yeah. Well, we, have still, we have another question. Another question. Okay. any lab values here too. It's just for this example I use that. She had two ways. I think she had like that count, which is counting multiple instances of it. And then I think when you look at that drug, it looks like she's doing something a little more. I brought up the concept. So there's a limited number of options for specific programs. Yeah, that's the key simplifying attribute of this table, is you're getting 
one row per patient. You can imagine lots of other things, you know, one encounter per row and so forth, one time period per row. But most, interestingly enough, most um, calculations, machine learning calculations, want this. For whatever reason, that's how things are done. So it's like you do the aggregate. Now, some of these aggregates could be over a time period, right? You could say these Parkinson's disease count, you know, for you could have a column for every year, for example, right? Um, okay. Set date, set date yes, there. If you just yeah. click there, it, it will give you option to narrow your search. But um, but this but humans and then their ability to program machines seem to really focus down on this, you know, very simplified kind of thing, just like you said. Now, um, sometimes you do need to look at right? And um, actually, Dave is working on that in a way that humans like to look at. Uh, uh, Dave Wang is working on that because humans like to look at that detail in a timeline, right? And they kind of hover around the timeline, but that's really nothing but a bunch of facts, like laid out with a timeline. Is. So that's the way to view a timeline. But for 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 patients, uh, for for this kind of aggregate data, this one row per patient, very natural for people. And then a, a common starting point for machine learning. Any questions? Any question? Yeah. <clears throat> Going back to the, the question of more than one I2B2, um, one is for ACT, one is for your local I2B2. Uh, but this gentleman over here, pardon me for pointing, um, suggested that there's you can have an I2B2 that supports. A single instance of, of that that supports both local web client and the ACT network. And so I'm wondering, is it is it true that we can have like a separate project in I2B2 so to support ACT and a separate project to support our local I2B2, where you know you have your CRC data and ontology for ACT, but a separate CRC data and ontology to support the local I2B2s on a single instance. Can't remember. Is that something that you should be able to do or not be able to do? You should. Okay. You should be able to do that. I think his is the, is the more difficult one because he has the two mm -hmm. uh, CRCs, but I think a lot of people have the one CRC and different clients pointing to it in different ways. Because no, I was talking about two different CRCs for two different projects. Each CRC has its own and those are two different its own ontology, but they're both within the same. I2B2, yes. Yeah. Yeah. What? What's that? Call that picture for me. <laughs> you can have one. <laughs> 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 Good use case for a particular kind yeah, of yeah. Yeah. 
I think Doug and Mark. Shrine network that we want to be a part of. So we would, we would like to, you know, combine as as, a, as, a, as many resources that we can, but of course, limitations on that. And so, um, but as much as we, we want to keep it to a minimum, naturally, because everything you spin up costs money, and it's another it's another VM to uh, to maintain. So. Now there was somebody on one of these calls, I think, that was using views. To spin up like for different networks. Yeah. Yeah. How does that work? Who is that? Somebody said we. Yeah. 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 The limitations of views are um, you can't, uh, well, you can, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, metaphorically, you can't transfer uh, log objects uh, across the field. Right. Um, I think there may be indexing issues. So it does kind of um, limit the size or speed of the view. And, you know, and, and it's kind of it's problematic if you, if, you know, for the XML, uh, what is it, the XML field or whatever. Oh, the so data, metadata XML. Yeah. Okay. okay. So like getting things by value yeah. is hard enough. So, so in short, we ended up doing some of views for tables where we don't need um, log views, but not all of them. So there are a few copies. Well, that reminds me. In the new ontology, I did actually at the top level of my diagnosis, whatever I did implement them on um, the you know, search, you know, text search stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Um, what do you think? So when you drag, if you drag the word diagnosis over, or you drag the word procedure over, you can type text string and it'll search. Um, the last time. Uh, no, so you type a word and then when you do the query, it searches what column is that? Um, which one column is called? Um, text. Text care. So uh, that is in the new ontology. It'll have that little back up accessibility thing. If you search the blog, not the, I don't do the blog. Okay, I don't in the text care field. Right, so the XML no, I think I put was the text care field. So you would be able to use that if you did. Okay. So now um, I know I'm here and we put this meeting in here at four, so I don't know how long you have to present. So this is maybe more of a workflow question here. So there's a data export. So it's probably the idea that any clinical trial or monitor site can take some time to recruit a patient. So you may want to do multiple export. Please refresh your data so you may have new patient that meets the criteria of a patient that far far because they, they, they take on new patients or something. Is there a start about instead of a, having a few that you have to compare the export outcome every time? Maybe ability to mark 
So both of these are new patients, and these are the patients that are no longer qualified as long as the previous group. Does that make sense? I think there's a lot of complexity in that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you can. And so, <laughs> when, you, when you do the selection of the patient, it does, you mark the ones and it'll persist. So, if you do a new query, you get some new, some old patients, it knows like, who you can. Oh, it does? Yeah. Okay. So it'll it'll basically let's say you get half new patients, like roughly every other patient will be already checked off if you went through them, mm -hmm. but it'll have the new patients in there. Mm -hmm. You can start working on that. And, and the beauty of this is that so I think that was the importance of that Jay mentioned that you should in each day of refresh the patient, keeping the patient numbers the same is important. Mm -hmm. But the great thing about it is because you're working with the workplace, uh, that's why you demonstrated that you can create you know folders. So you can create a folder for like excluded patients, right? You can create a folder for like potential patients. And so as you're working, of course, you know, the, one, of, one of the options is to pick a folder you're working on. So one day you might work on just excluded patients and you select that excluded folder and you'll see all the check boxes. And once you do a data refresh, you can always go back and see that those are the patients you're really this is not a question about, about my and I'm just ask this question. So it is possible so that every time you break the data on a certain rate, a uh, rate rate interval, it will be run with query. Basically. <laughs> 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 okay, so, uh, I have another question. Okay, um, I'm sorry, but I could jump in here, but I have to answer because it's the ITPC transport symposium, right? So I2B2, we have to install this for app. So can we install I2B2 slash transform? Oh. <laughs> My understanding is that you can uh, put I2B2 transform. Because I2B2 is just sitting there. And the I2B2 transform is like a giant plug. <laughs> And so my understanding, unless there's like some details that you know that you know, could be right. My understanding is that you could do I to B2, part of I to B2 transpart to the shrine stuff, and then you would have the transpar part available to like again that instance of I to B2 that's in you know in that whole. So, so this is the I2B2 version right. compatible shrine that's in the I2B2 transpar. It just happens to be happens to be in trans I2B2 transpar is 092. Okay, so there you are. I'll see that. I feel the next shrine update requires the whole idea. But that is that's a very important uh, thing driving for for over time with the computer. Okay, as I showed you the plugins, how easy they are to use. We also thought of ease of installation. So the installation uh, is as painless as possible. And one option we are going to provide you is Docker. We'll have a Docker hub where you can ex um, extract uh, these plugins from and when you run some scripts. Um, you will have a fully functional web client, I2B2 web client that will have the uh, these all three plugins preloaded into it, and it will be less than five minutes of installation. And if you're wondering when you are going to get a hold of these wonderful plugins, in 2019, Web One, Web Two, and Web Three are going to get them, and Web Four have to wait a little further. And if you cannot absolutely wait to use them, it's what. We need volunteer testers. <laughs> if you're interested, please let us know. We'd love to help you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Bhakti. And that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for spending the day with us and for all of your work towards everything we do for the ACT Network. I know we have some representatives from our various work groups here, and I know all of you and your work in just onboarding and maintaining um, ACT to our specs. It's just, it's really awesome. So thank you so much. And a huge thank you to 
the wonderful folks you heard from today. So our network ops and support team. So Sam and Mark, guys, stand up. And Mitch and Maswati and Vivian and Jay and Michelle, these folks make all of this possible and they, they work really hard to make sure you have the support that you need to be a participating um, ACT institution. So thank you guys very much. Thank you.